now we can define torque as sum of all torque is equal to I alpha. And this is Newton's second law of rotations. So if you remember, Right? If you remember, Newton's second law of motion, we set all the stuff to, right, sum of all forces equal to ma, right? And then we set sum of all forces is equal to, right, like we, we mentioned, like, you know, F1, like, you know, minus tension, like, right? Etc. Right, plus uh, Fg, like etc. etc. Right. So then we set these equal to each other. Right, ma is equal to like F1 minus tension. Like remember that. So if you were to think about something like this on this side, we can set sum of all torque is equal to I alpha, just like the way we set F equals ma. Then we need to define what torques are, like, you know, torque 1 plus torque 2 minus torque 3, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then set these two equal to each other. So I alpha is equal to torque 1 plus torque 2 minus torque 3, etc. Okay? And it's very important. You always start with Newton's second law dynamics, whether it's rotations or just translation, and define all the forces here for translation and define all the torques for rotations, and then set them equal to each other. All right? So how do we define this I? The moment of inertia, we defined it to sum of mr squared. But this mr squared is only good for just point particles and a hoop, okay? So this is not a general equation. So use this equation, right, for all point particles, right? or thin hoop. Okay, so that's also important. Okay. And and depending on the system, you will have different okay, you have different moment of inertia. Now this is on in last page right here. Like page 23, like cylindrical shell or hoop, your moment of inertia is mr squared. If it's a solid cylinder about the axis, then it is one half mr squared. Right? So all these different moment of inertias are here, like for example, a rod that goes through the center like this, perpendicular to the rod, that's 1 12th ml squared. And if it's at the end, then it's 1 3rd ml. And, and all these different moment of inertias have to be identified. All right? So we will practice some of those, and maybe we will even derive some of those moment of inertias for the particular shapes. Okay? So, how to think about torque? Well, first thing you should think about, torque must be specified about a pivot point. So, you must find out where the pivot point is, and everything has to be measured from that pivot point, right? So, this pivot point, PP, right? Always find this first.
okay? And torque is a product quantity made up of distance and force, okay? So R cross F, torque causes angular acceleration, just like force causes translational acceleration. in the same way that force causes linear accelerations. The moment of inertia I, right, the moment of inertia I, is a measure of resistance to rotation analogous to mass. Okay? Is a measure of inertia for linear motion. So, it tends to resist rotating, right? Or resist from slowing down when it's rotating already, okay? So it's like rotational inertia, or you could think of it as rotational mass, okay? Five, we can't see or touch torque, just like force, right? But we can see the effects of it. And when we say when things are in equilibrium, it means the sum of all forces is equal to zero, and this is very important, and sum of all torques is equal to zero. That does not mean that just because your net force is zero, it doesn't mean it has to be at rest. It could be at rest but it also could be moving at a constant velocity. Similarly, just because your net torque is zero, it does not mean it's not turning, it's not rotating. It could be rotating at a constant omega, okay? So this, and this just means it does not have linear acceleration and it does not have rotational acceleration, okay? So for this, it could be at rest, or it could be translating and rotating with constant V or omega, okay? So that's very important. All right. So let's take a look at an example problem. We have a point particle system and here's the pivot point, right? This is the pivot point. Now, if you were to think about mass 1, mass 2, and mass 3, and each mass has force applied to it. For example, mass 1 has force F1 applied at 30 degree in a positive angle, right, to the right, to the x-axis. Mass 2 has force 2 acting directly along the x-axis. And mass 3 is in third quadrant, and force is in third quadrant at 45 degrees reference angle. So this is 45, so 180 plus 45 is 225, right? So it's very important to understand now that we have to find torque for each of these, then find the moment of inertia for the whole system, and then set them equal to each other, right? So that we have to find torque one, torque two, and torque three, right? And then find the moment of inertia for these three particle system, and then set the torques equal to each other. So, for part A, calculate the moment of inertia for the system. Now here it looks like M1 is one kilogram, M2 is two kilograms, M3 is three kilograms, okay? R1 is the distance from the pivot point where the mass one is located, okay? So this is the pivot point right here. Okay. 
R2 is the distance where M2 is located relative to the pivot point. And R3 is distance M3 is located relative to the pivot point. All right. So let's think about calculating the moment of inertia. Okay. So I total is equal to sum of right MR squared basically, right? Therefore, M1 R1 squared plus M2 R2 squared plus M3 R3 squared. Therefore, M1, 1 kilograms times R1, which is 3 squared plus M2, 2 kilograms, times R2, which is 2 meters squared, plus M3, 3 kilograms, R3, 4 meters squared. Therefore, 1 times 3 squares 9, 2 times 2 squares 4 plus times 2 is 8, Plus here, 4 square 16. 16 times 3 is 48. So we get 65 kilograms meters squared as my total moment of inertia. Okay. All right. Now, let's think about, calculate individual torques and net torque acting on the system. So here, if I were to redraw this force at a common point, so right at the pivot point, if I were to slide this down and draw the force here for my F1 and my R1, or I could just draw my R1 at here, okay, to figure out the magnitude of F and magnitude of R and the angle between them. And since, since this angle here is 40 degrees, and if I were to draw my F1 here, this angle right here is basically um, 50 minus 30, so this is 20 degrees, okay? So, let's just say, if I draw everything at the pivot point, it's going to be messy, so I'm going to just slide this R vector up here, which will give us pretty much the same dimensions. So here is my R1. And this angle here happens to be 20 degrees, as we agreed upon, right? So because this is 40, so this has to be 50, right, complementary angle. And if you take away 30, then it has to be 20. Okay? So if you want, I guess you could put 50 here, just say, okay? So what is torque 1? Torque 1 is equal to R1 cross F1, okay? So torque 1 is equal to R1 cross F1. That is basically the magnitude of R times the magnitude of F1 times sine of theta between 
R1 and F1, right? So R1 has magnitude of 3 meters. F1 has magnitude of 10 newtons. times sine of 20 degrees. Now, n hat. What about the n hat? So here, r cross f, my right hand rule says, is going into the page, so it's negative z hat. Okay? So if you work this out, you should get negative 10.26 meter newtons z hat as my torque one. Now let's talk about torque two. Torque two, we have R that is two meters, right? And F2 is 5 newtons. So if I were to draw, I guess my R2 here. Oops. So here's my R2. And the angle between them here is 90 degrees. Okay? Therefore, my torque 2 is equal to R2 cross F2. Right. So torque 2 is equal to R2 cross F2, which is equal to, I mean, I could rewrite all this, R2 F2 sine of theta between R and F n hat which is equal to R2, which is 2 meters, F2 is 5 newtons times sine of 90 degrees, and R cross F. R cross F, my thumb's pointing up, so it's positive Z hat. Okay, positive Z hat. Therefore, if you work that out, you get 2 times 5 times 1, you get positive 10 meter newtons z hat. Okay. Now, let's take a look at torque 3. Okay. So torque 3 is equal to R3 cross F3. Right? Oh, crap. I should have put it down a little bit better. So here's my R3. My R3 is at 4 meters, so here's my R3. And the angle, so since this is um, 35 degrees here, this is 35 degrees, right? So here's 35. So add 45 to it. So the angle between the R and F, right, happens to be 80 degrees. Okay? Okay. So, torque 3 is equal to R3 cross F3, which is the magnitude of R3 times the magnitude of F3 times sine of theta between R and F and hat, which is equal to R3, 4 meters, F3, 3 newtons times sine of 80 degrees. Now the direction R 
cross F, right? R cross F, positive Z hat. And if you work that out, 12 times sine of 90, right? So it's like 11.82 meter newtons as a positive Z hat. All right, so what is my net torque? My net torque is equal to, right? Torque one plus torque two plus torque three. That is negative 10.26 plus 10 plus 11.82, right? Meter Newton's Z hat. That is, if I add all these up, I'm going to get positive 11.56 Z hat as my net torque. Okay. So calculate the angular acceleration. So what is angular acceleration? Well, if there's definitely net torque, there's definitely going to be some angular acceleration going on, right? So here, we know torque now is equal to also I alpha, right? So, therefore, right, alpha is equal to torque divided by the moment of inertia. And that is equal to positive 11.56 z hat, divide that by I, which is 65 kilograms meters squared. So my alpha becomes positive 0 0.178 radians per second squared z hat is my alpha. Now you may ask, how would you go from torque meter newtons to radians per second squared, right? If you look at the units, if you look at the units, here I have meter newtons. Divide that by moment of inertia is kilograms meters squared. That is equal to meters times kilograms times meters per second squared is what Newton is. Divide that by kilograms meters squared. So if you think about how meters times meters here cancels out with meters squared. And then how kilograms cancels out with kilograms. What you have left here is just second squared. Remember that radians is basically a unitless, right? Just fictitious unit. So that's how we get radians per second squared. It could just pop up out of nowhere or it could just disappear without any mathematical cancellations. And that's how we get the unit of radians per second squared. All right. And then for part D, if the system starts at an angular velocity, omega naught is equal to four radians per second, and it is spinning clockwise, Right? It's spinning clockwise. So it's spinning 
clockwise is this way. Okay? So, if it's spinning this way, our omega is negative z hat. Right? I don't know if you can see that. Neg this is spinning clockwise. It's negative z hat going right in. Okay? So, my omega initial, right? Omega initial. Or omega naught is negative, right? Four radians per second. Z hat, right? So since my alpha is positive, what's going to happen to this thing? Because it's spinning this way, but my alpha is this way, positive Z hat, so it's trying to slow it down, okay? So, we know alpha is equal to positive, right? 0 0.178 radians per second squared, Z hat. So, calculate the time it takes for a pinwheel to stop. Right? It's going to stop instantaneously and then it's going to slow down, slow down, slow down, slow down, instantaneously, and then it's going to start to speed up in the opposite direction eventually. So we have to use omega final is equal to omega initial plus alpha t, which is equation number one, right? Equation number one. So omega final is zero. Omega initial is omega naught, which is negative four, plus... 0 0.178 T. Therefore, 4 is equal to 0 0.178 T. So my T is equal to 22.5 seconds. All right. All right, let's take five minute break, and then I'll, we'll come back. Let's take a look at what happens when things are rotating. Now, we know when things are moving, it has kinetic energy, right? But when things are rotating, it's moving. And if it's moving, it must have kinetic energy, all right? So if we were to analyze that motion, this V here is actually V tangential, right, or linear speed, okay? And if radius R here, we know it's going in a circular motion, so the kinetic energy of this mass itself is just one-half mv squared, okay? But let's consider a wheel made up of many such masses. So we have, you know, mass here, mass here, mass here, same masses all around to make up a nice hoop, right? Well, then if I add up all the kinetic energies of each mass, right? That's what that represents, okay? However, we know that our V tangential is equal to omega R, right? So if we substitute this omega R into my V here, and then square it, so I get my omega R quantity squared, right? What do I get? I get here one half M I R squared omega squared, right? But we know 
this right here mr squared has to be the moment of inertia therefore our new kinetic energy which is rotational kinetic energy can be defined as one half i omega squared and that is so important okay so when we have an object rotating we have kinetic energy and its rotational kinetic energy. And this rotational kinetic energy of an object rotating can be defined as one half i omega squared, which is very, very similar to one half mv squared, right? Now, if it's rolling, so instead of just rotating at a fixed axis, let's say, if, if it's, let's say it's rolling, now you have translational motion as well as rotational motion. So you have two forms of kinetic energies. So you have translational plus rotational to have a total kinetic energy. So you must then find the translational motion, which is motion at the center of mass. So the translational kinetic energy can be defined as 1 half mv center of mass squared plus rotational kinetic energy, which is one half I omega squared, okay? So if we have two things here, for example, let's say I have a block that slides down, okay? So sliding, right? When it slides down, this original height here, which is the initial position, we will have basically potential energy gravitation initial here. That will translate to kinetic energy, right? At the final position, it will be kinetic energy final. So if it slides down without rotating, it's simply, right, potential energy initial is equal to kinetic energy final, therefore mgh, right, if this is m, is equal to one-half mv final squared. However, if we have something that is rolling down, right? So this is mass M, and it's rolling down. Now, we don't know if this is like a, a marble, like a spherical ball, or a hoop, or a cylinder. We don't know. We just know it's rolling down, right? It's going to have different eyes, depending on what the shape of that is. However, this right here, which is original height h, which is the initial position, we will have potential energy gravitation here initially. However, for the final position right here, we will have kinetic energy total, which means it is going to be rotating as well as translating at the same time, right? So because it is translating down here as well as rotating we will have two forms of kinetic energy in this case so for now we say potential energy initial gravitation must equal to kinetic energy total final so potential energy initial gravitation is just mgh and that has to equal to one half m v sub c m squared plus one half i 
omega squared, okay? Because kinetic energy total is equal to kinetic energy rotational plus kinetic energy translational, okay? So, notice how different things turn out, okay? It's very important that we understand that. All right, so if we could put this all together now, right, we could say, okay, well, linear motion, we had displacement of delta x, right? If we were to say the position, if we were to say the position was like, Position was x, right? Then displacement is change in x. And then angular position, right? Angular position is just theta, right? So angular displacement is change in theta, right? So velocity linearly is dx over dt. Angular velocity is omega which is d theta dt. Acceleration is the first derivative of velocity or second derivative of the position. Angular acceleration is alpha, which is first derivative of omega or second derivative of theta. Here are the constant acceleration equations for translational or linear motion. Here's the constant angular acceleration, right, which is really not that much different except it's all Greek, right? So the mass for translational is m. However, rotational, we call it moment of inertia, i. And momentum, which is mass times velocity, angular momentum is capital L, sometimes it's represented with lowercase l, okay, is I omega. Force is equal to ma, torque is equal to I alpha, which is also equal to right, R cross F, power, this is instantaneous power, by the way, right, is F dot V, where torque dot omega is instantaneous power. You could also calculate the average power as work, right, divide by time, right? So, what about work and kinetic energy, right? Well, we could add that in here if you want, right? So here, the Newton's second law for translation, sum of all forces equal to, right? The first derivative of the momentum, or is equal to ma. Well, Newton's second law for rotations, the sum of all torques is equal to the first derivative of angular momentum, or I alpha, okay? So kinetic energy here, we defined it here as one half mv squared, and kinetic energy rotational is equal to one half I omega squared, okay? All right, any questions? Well, what about work? 
for work is equal to, right, we defined it as f dot d, right, displacement vector, right? Well, work in rotational sense, we can define that as torque dot delta theta. Okay. And the unit will be in joules, just like this one. Okay. So let's take a look how that happens. Okay. So let's, I mean, we got up to, I guess, all the way up to here. We did this, and we even did this, right? So we really didn't talk about this momentum, John, and work, right, and power. So let's talk about those things. So here, definition of angular momentum, if you think about called recalling Newton's second law, F, external is equal to ma, so the net external force is equal to mass times acceleration, right? So we know that that's Newton's second law of motion, right? This is Newton's second law of rotational motion, right? So here, F equals ma, a is dv over dt, so if we multiply m times dv, we get change in momentum right here. Therefore, this is equal to right, change in momentum over change in time. So we can define the net force is equal to now the first derivative of the momentum with respect to time. Okay? Similarly, if I were to use I alpha as my net external torque, I alpha is delta omega over delta T. This represents delta L over delta T because this is angular momentum, right? It's, this is actually just linear momentum. Okay? So, this is now Newton's second law in momentum form, okay? Or this is Newton's second law in momentum form for translational. Okay. And just like the translational, as long as there's no external force acting on the system, the momentum must be conserved, right? So the conservation of momentum must happen for both rotational and translational, as long as there's no external force and there's no external torque in the system, okay? So if net torque is equal to zero, then 
dl over dt has to also equal to zero. There's no negotiation on that. That means the sum of all angular momentum initial must equal to sum of all angular momentum final. Okay? So if you could think about this as like rotational collision, Explosions or implosions, right? Okay. We will use this in chapter. So conservation of angular momentum must exist, okay? So this is very, very important. This is only true again if the net torque is equal to zero. All right. Then now we talked about um, angular momentum. Now we need to talk about work and power. Okay? And then we're done. So, work and power for rotations. So we did with pretty much everything up to and including like chapter 11 from your summer assignments to chapter 10, I guess, right? And all that in rotation in one chapter right now, okay? So if you're not familiar with what's going on with chapter two through 10, it's going to be difficult, or, or it could actually be helpful to revisit these concepts in translation through rotations. Okay, so I guess it's always better to see it as class half full rather than half empty, right? So let's take a look at work. Work, we know it is F dot delta S or delta R or F dot right? Dx. So work by mathematical definition is equal to F dot ds. But usually it's the tangential force times the displacement is what we really work about, right? So if we were to take a look at this ds, which is actually just the displacement from the initial position to final position, but in a circular form, that is the arc length, right? So if we were to look at the force vector, which is force tangential, so here's the force vector. So this is the F tangential. And the displacement vector is instantaneous displacement vector is same direction like so, which is delta S, right? So since they are going in the same direction, cosine of angle happens to be zero. So cosine of zero is one, okay? And since delta S, right, because we know theta is equal to S over R, therefore delta S is equal to, oh, I'm sorry, delta S over R is equal to delta theta, right? So we can say delta S is equal to 
delta theta times r. So if we substitute this into our equation here, we get work is equal to F10 delta theta r, okay? However, however, if we were to think about torque is equal to R cross F. This is not correct. Right? And since R and F are always going to be perpendicular, this angle here is 90 degrees. I would switch these R and F. Okay. So because F tangential and R will always be 90 degrees, okay, so my torque is equal to R F tan times 1, right? Therefore, if you solve for F10 and R here is torque, right? And then if you multiply this, my R's will cancel out, giving me Let's write that here. Work is equal to then, right? Torque divided by R times delta S, which is delta theta times R, right? Then R's will cancel out, giving me work now is equal to. delta theta. So, that's rotational work. Now, will it do any work along the radial direction? As long as the radius stays constant, the radial direction won't do any work at all. Only the F tangential will do work. Because if you're looking at it this way, this F and the sine of theta will be zero, then this will go to zero. Okay? All right. All right. Now, if we divide that by time, we get power. So power is equal to work divided by time. Therefore, delta work over delta T is equal to torque times delta theta over delta T. Right? We're going to assume the torque is constant. And once that happens, delta theta over delta T is omega. Therefore, my power can be calculated as instantaneous power is torque dot omega. And that is instantaneous power. This torque has to be constant here. All right, now we covered everything, okay? So let's take a look at one example problem that deals with all this stuff that we just learned. 
And let's talk about an Atwood machine. Okay. So here, we're going to use sum of all torque and sum of all force, right, for A and alpha. And then we're going to use kinetic energy, potential energy, right, for all the Vs and omega Fs. But don't forget, some kinetic energy is going to be rotational kinetic energy as well. So be careful with that, right? So, Atwood machine, George Atwood, right? Example, a body of mass, 1.2 kilogram is tied to a light string wound, right, around a 2.5 kilogram wheel of radius of 0.2 meters. Now, this here, We're going to assume this to be a solid wheel, like a disc, okay? Or simply disc, okay? That means if it's a solid wheel, it's going to be acting like a solid cylinder. So my solid cylinder will behave as moment of inertia will be one half mr squared. Okay. So maybe that can be clarified. But my moment of inertia for solid wheel is equal to one half mr squared. Okay. Therefore. The moment of inertia right, is equal to one half times two point five times zero point two squared. Okay. So what is that, John? So you get point two squared times point five times. I get my moment of inertia is equal to 0 0.05 kilograms meter squared. Okay? That's the moment of inertia for this wheel. Okay? The wheel bearing is frictionless, so you don't have to worry about any kind of friction happening between the wheel and the, and the, and the axle. Find the tension in the string, tension in, wow, that's bad. Find the tension in the string, right? The acceleration of the block and its speed after it has fallen a distance of 0.25 meters from rest. There's a lot going on here, okay? So if we were to take a look at what's going on for this mass right here, which is 1.2 kilograms, okay? So this mass okay, there's definitely tension going up this way. And there's definitely FG going down this way. Okay. And of course, FG is equal to O times G, which is 1.2 times 9.8. All right. Which is equal to 11.76 newtons. All right, tricky, 
right? You must use the fact that tangential linear motion on the rim of the wheel is same as the linear motion of the falling block, okay? So the V tangential of this rim has to be the same V as this block moving down here when it's reaching down to this location, okay? So let's take a look at this pulley first, this wheel, okay? Since this is going to be rotating, we have to use sum of all torque is equal to I alpha. And because it'd be turning in a clockwise direction, Right? My alpha would be in negative z axis. Okay? So clockwise is equal to negative z hat for alpha. Okay? Now, if we were to look for sum of all torque is equal to, well, there's only one torque that's going to cause this object to, this to rotate, and that is caused by the tension. The tension is also going to be pulling this string this way, right, with R radius, right? So my torque is going to be just R cross Tension T. That's, that's the only torque that it, that it possesses. Therefore, we can set these equal to each other. Right? So I alpha is equal to, right? Now R cross T is going to also be negative. So this is also going to be negative. Okay? So R times T times sine of 90 degrees because R and T are going to be 90 degrees times negative Z hat. And we already said that this is negative Z hat. I should say negative z hat. So these negative z hats will cancel out. Okay. So here my i becomes 0 0.05 times right alpha is equal to okay. Here my r is 0 0.2 times tension times 1. So we have two equations, well, two unknowns here, so we need a second equation. Okay? Now let's take a look at the block. Okay? This block right here. We say sum of all force is equal to MA. And then sum of all forces here is equal to, just looking at this, I have FG plus tension. Now we know FG, we're going to keep that positive because that's the direction of motion, and we're going to keep tension negative. So MA is equal to FG minus tension. Okay. Therefore, if I solve for tension, my tension then becomes mg minus ma. 
okay? Which is tension is equal to that mg, which is 11.76 minus 1.2a. But we know A is equal to alpha R. Okay? So we can actually use this information and plug that into here to say tension now is equal to 11.76 minus 1.2, right? Alpha R. Alpha times R, which is 0.2, right? Okay. So when I plug this into here, okay. So if I plug this tension into here. Then I get 0 0.05 alpha is equal to uh, 0 0.2 times all this mass, right, which is 11.76 minus, what is, um, Alpha, right? So if I distribute this through, then I get 0 0.05 alpha is equal to, right? Bring this to the other side, 0 0.098 alpha is equal to 2.352. So my alpha is equal to, right, uh, 24 radians per second squared, right? All right, and then you can basically use that to get your acceleration. So my acceleration is equal to right, uh, alpha, which is twenty four times. Um, 0 0.2, and you should be able to get your acceleration. Wait, something's wrong. All right, I mean, check my math. You should be able to get this. Uh, 
it must be somewhere. I'll put a negative sign in the wrong place or something. All right, so point to, can I make point to it? Okay, ex okay, acceleration, okay. That negative doesn't really matter because I consider this to be positive. So it's okay, 4.8, I'm okay, okay. Meters per second squared. That negative is just basically directional thing, okay? So positive 4.8 meters per second squared is okay, all right? It, it is okay. Then you could actually calculate how fast this thing is moving by saying, right, Vf squared is equal to Vi squared plus 2A delta Y, right? You say Vf squared is equal to 0 squared plus 2 times 4.8 times delta Y is basically 0.25 meters. So my VF, if you work that out, should come out to uh, 1.55 meters per second. Okay. And then you can also figure this thing out by using just energies. Okay. So think about the total energy initial equaling total energy final. The total energy initial is just potential energy gravitation of mass one, right? Final kinetic energy, we have kinetic energy, right, for the mass one plus kinetic energy, right, of mass rotational kinetic energy, right? So we have to think about this rotating, right, at a fixed point. So it only has rotational kinetic energy caused by this potential energy moving down. So you can actually say MGH is equal to one-half M this M right here, M1, right, times V squared plus one-half I omega squared. So if you think about this V and this omega, right, so V is equal to omega R, so substitute that into my C omega here, so V over R into here, and you should be able to calculate for V. So try that on your own, and you should get V is equal to 1.55 meters per second. All right. I will end the lecture there, and I will see you, um, I guess, Wednesday. All right? Thank All you, right. Mr. Kim.